God, we confess, we are loose ends. You give us the gift of community, and we weave walls of exclusion and isolation. You give us the gift of a new day, and we spend more time unraveling justice than sowing seeds of peace and unity. You give us the gift of holy surprises and unimaginable beauty, and we shut off our hearts and our blindfolded eyes. Forgive us for our frayed ends and self-centered hearts. Unravel the sin in us and replace it with love. Gratefully we pray. Amen. The scripture is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. Hear the word of God. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasens, and when he had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one could restrain him any more, even with a chain for he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart, and the shackles he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there on the hillside, a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, Send us into the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine, and the herd, numbering about two thousand, rushed down the steep bank into the sea, and were drowned in the sea. The swineherds ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus 
and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion, and they were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Calvary, and welcome to another wonderful Sunday. We are continuing our summer sermon series on the Gospel of Mark, and last week we did a little bit of a hiatus. Reese preached for us, and he did a story found in the Gospel of Matthew, but now we are back to the Gospel of Mark. And before I get into our sermon for this morning, I want to ask you a question, which is, what image or images come to your mind when you hear me say the word monster? Or if you hear me use the expression monsterize, to monsterize someone or something, what does that mean? So think about that for just a second. Who comes to mind? What comes to mind? What's the definition of a monster? Now, you might think that I am crazy that I'm even asking this question in a sermon, which is supposed to be about the Bible, because you might be saying to yourself, Melson, there are no monster stories in the Bible, so why on earth are we going to talk about monsters? Well, the reality is, is that if you look at monster stories as a genre, there actually are plenty of instances of monster stories in scripture. In fact, if you go all the way back to the very, very beginning and you look at the book of Genesis, then you hear that when God speaks things into being, what God is essentially doing is taking chaos and creating order out of that chaos. And that's an important thing to note because in most monster stories and in the monster genre, there is this idea that there is somehow some sort of order to the world and that a monster essentially breaks that order and once again imparts chaos. So another way to think about it is that the order that God has created through creation is somehow disrupted and returned back to chaos through the existence of a monster. But that's not the only instance of a monster story in scripture. Fast forward just a couple of chapters later, still in Genesis, we get the story of Noah and the great flood. And most of the time when you hear people talk about that story and you hear them talk about it, especially in Sunday school with young children, they gloss over the very, very beginning of the story of Noah. And instead, people are just told that those that lived then were wicked and God saw their wickedness and decided to do away with them and sort of start over, do a redo. And that's why God instructed Noah to build an ark and bring on his family and all of the animals so that everything could begin again. But the question is, why was the world so wicked? What was going on? And this is the part of the story that's actually the beginning that tends to be glossed over. And what we're told in the beginning of the Noah story is that there are these beings, heavenly beings, that look upon human women and find them to be beautiful and begin to procreate with these women. 
And what comes about is this mixed creature, mixed race that's half human, half these heavenly beings, and that they become these great, great warriors. And that is what God sees and finds to be abhorrent and wicked. Now, what is it about this that is wicked? We actually don't know. I mean, there's plenty of things that we could speculate. Is it the fact that there's this crossbreeding taking place? Is that what is in and of itself wicked? Is the fact that they become great warriors, is that, what, is that what's wicked? We don't know. Um, and if you look back to the Midrash, which is commentary that our Jewish brothers and sisters, Jewish rabbis, have written over the centuries. You will see that there's a lot of speculation about why this was wicked. But the possibilities, regardless of you know, what they are, God found it um, unacceptable and God decided to start over. But what's really interesting is that when you read about these heavenly beings, about this Nephilim, what you hear is that they are warriors of renown just as they are now. Now, if you take the Noah story literally then, right, when Noah goes onto the ark and he brings his family and he brings all the animals, then this like mixed creation should be eradicated, should be wiped clean from the earth. But we're told that they still exist. And so there's this idea that this monstrosity, that this monstrous creation, even after the flood, still pervades the earth. Now, before we get to our passage for this morning, there's something else that I need to say. And this always weirds people out, so I understand that. And if it makes you feel strange or uncomfortable, I'm sorry, we could talk about it later, but uh, we really can't talk about it and do justice to it in the midst of our sermon for this morning, if we're gonna make it short. But there are plenty of books that are non-canonical, meaning there are books that um, didn't make it into the Bible for whatever reason. And it always weirds people out when I show them how many books didn't make it into the canonized Bible. Do you see this? This is actually a book that you can buy by HarperCollins Publishers. It's called The Other Bible. But the reason why I'm mentioning all of this is because in the other Bible, in one of these non-canonical books, there is First Enoch. And First Enoch actually goes back and revisits this monster genre and this idea of Nephilim that come out of Genesis and the flood story. And Enoch refers to them as watchers and talks about their continued existence and how they end up getting ran off a cliff and destroyed. But it essentially is a monster story. So why does all of this matter? Well, because if you were paying attention to our scripture reading for this morning, then you probably have already noticed now that there are some similarities between this person that Jesus encounters and the watchers in First Enoch. So Jesus has crossed the Sea of Galilee with his disciples. He's gotten to the other side, to the Gentile side. And the first person that Jesus encounters is this man who is possessed by lots and lots of demons. And sometimes you hear pastors talk about this text, and they talk about it as a story about possession and evil spirits and forces. Sometimes you hear pastors talk about this passage as a passage about um, mental health and mental illness and possibly schizophrenia. But we're going to talk about it through the lens of a monster story. 
because this person isn't described in Scripture as a man, as a human being. Rather, he's described as a creature. And we're told that he has supernatural strength and that the people have tried to subdue him. Now, we don't know why the people have tried to subdue him. It might be uh, for his own safety and protection. It might be so that they can be safe themselves around him, but we're told that they try to chain him up and that he is so strong that he breaks the ropes and chains that they try to put upon him. So he has supernatural strength. And then we're told that he's always thrashing about and mangling himself and everything about him is like he is a monster. And this is the person that Jesus encounters. And that's why I wanted to start off our time together thinking about, well, what does it mean when we use the word monster? What image comes to our mind? But the more important question is the second one I asked, which is what does it mean to monsterize? And I think that asking the question, well, what does it mean to monsterize someone or something is important? Because if you think about stereotypical monster stories, let's take, for example, one of my daughter's favorites, Beauty and the Beast. You have all of these townspeople who are different from each other, are unique, are individuals, and then they hear that there is a monster in their midst, the beast, and they all decide to join forces, they all go get their torches and their pitchforks and whatever they have that they can use as a weapon because they're people of the land, and they form this gang and they go to try to take care of the beast, of the monster. And in typical monster genre fashion, they aren't able to conquer the beast. But it's interesting that because they have monster-sized this person, the beast, they suddenly forget about all of their differences and what sets them apart and makes them unique because they all have this shared goal and purpose, which is to conquer and destroy someone who is other and different from them. And while we may find that this is like a common narrative, a common thread in the monster genre, the reality is, is that we do this in real life all the time. We take certain people, um, people from our personal history, people from world history, and we monsterize, monsterize them. A classic example of this is Adolf Hitler. We think of him as a monster because how could he possibly be a human being? He thought of such horrible, horrific things to do to others. He, he can't be one of us. And we do that so that we're able to hold him at arm's length and to be able to tell ourselves that we don't have that same capacity to do harm to others. But we don't just monsterize individuals, but we also monsterize systems and issues. So if you take, for example, the idea of slavery, we have monsterized slavery. Even if the people who participated in slavery were our own ancestors, because that's the only way that we can somehow rationalize that there were people who felt like it was okay to own and possess another person, to oppress, to beat, to marginalize, to rape, to take advantage of another human being. They were all monsters. And we do this again and again and again, that we monsterize different people and different systems. And on one hand, that's okay. It's okay to be appalled at something, 
and to not ever want to repeat that or do that again or to say that is so villainous that can't be part of my personal story or the story of the people around me like we will never go there we will never do that but at the same time we then tend to look at anybody and everyone who is even slightly different from us and we monsterize them as well. Um, it may be based on their skin tone or their orientation or their ethnicity or what we think is their ethnicity. Just last week I went to the Olympic and Paralympic Museum in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And it's an amazing brand new museum that tells the story of the Olympics and the story of different Olympians throughout history. And one person who was a celebrated swimmer and was Korean was constantly accosted and asked why he wasn't in an internment camp because he had to be Japanese, right? So we monsterized the Japanese people. We monstersized people who we thought were Japanese. And we did it just because they were different from us. And so we have done this throughout history and we continue to do this now. What's really important about the story of Jesus and this man who is possessed is that Jesus does something that is such an important takeaway. It's a note that we need to make for ourselves. And that is anytime Jesus encounters someone who is different or burdened or has an issue, he is able to separate what's going on with them in their humanity. And so for Jesus, this man isn't a monster. He is a man who is possessed and yet also human. And so Jesus is able to take mercy on this man and to heal this man and to rid him of all of these spirits which go into the swine and then run off the edge of the cliff. And I think that Jesus' response to this man, that's the exact same response that we're supposed to have of always seeing someone's humanity in the midst of whatever else may be going on with them or with us or with the current events around us. And so that's one thing that's important about the story. But another thing that's important about the story is that once the man is healed, he actually becomes like the best evangelist that we've encountered so far in the Gospel of Mark. He's telling other people about what Jesus has done for him. And we're told that he's sitting there in his right mind, like he is fully restored and healed. And what happens? All of the townspeople, all the people who had monsterized him and tried to uh, wrap him up in ropes and chains, they once again gang up. And this time they go and gang up against Jesus. And they tell Jesus to please leave their city. And that's something else that happens when we monsterize others is that sometimes the very person who has come to liberate us is the person that we um, fight against and we disagree with and we vilify. And so just because someone is speaking a word of liberation, that doesn't make them a monster. That might make them the person that's being sent. And I don't think that it's any mistake at all that we've gone through this story of Jesus crossing the Sea of Galilee, of his disciples experiencing a storm, of them being terrified, and it being symbolic of 
oh my gosh, what have we gotten ourselves into? And we're about to go into strange territory. And of course, they end up being okay, right? But who should they meet? Who should be the first person they meet when they get to the other side but this man? And we talked two weeks ago about the journey and how the journey from going from one side to another, from unknowing to knowing, um, from growing and changing and having society grow and change, that the journey itself might be the scariest part, and it probably is. And also, when we encounter people that are different from us, the response shouldn't be to monsterize them, and rather the response should be to see their humanity and to embrace it and to not monsterize the people who have been sent to liberate us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. In a time before all-knowing, God is, and God's breath fills the emptiness, creating a universe, a world, an ecology, a biology, and us, humankind. All humankind, no exceptions, no imperfections, and all of us beloved just as we are. In a time before all-knowing, Christ Jesus watches the creating and steps out into creation, becoming, living, dying, and rising, all for us, all humankind, no exceptions, no reservations, all of us just as we are, God's beloved. In a time before all-knowing, the Spirit is and moves throughout every part of creation, consoling, interceding, leading, and refreshing all in the world, including us. All humankind, no exceptions, no differentiations, all of us just as we are. God's Beloved. My friends, I say to you, as now our time comes to a close, that I And now receive the benediction. May the grace and peace and love of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Hi.